welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Dennis Zen. Hello, Collider Movie people, and welcome to a brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. Super excited to be here. It is a Friday. We have a lot of good stories today. Got a lot of nice people joining us. Natasha, who else we have on the panel? Also joining us is Josh Makuga. What's up, Collider fans? <laughs> Psyched to be here. Really excited to talk more about Batman vs. Superman. I'm hoping it's not too much. And rounding off our panel is Jason Inman. I cannot believe the excitement that I'm feeling right here at this Movie Talk desk, guys. I'm excited to talk about movies. Let's do it. Just psyched. Yep. Incredibly. Yes. Yeah. Friday. Yes. It's a, Friday. it's a big day. It I will, is. I will yeah. say, I'm liking the, the new low flow. A lot less gel than usual. It's, oh, yeah. natural. You know, yeah. it's a little bit of a casual Friday type uh, approach that I'm okay, doing here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you got to share your hair yeah. secrets. I can yeah. tell seeing Batman v Superman twice has really agreed with you. <laughs> oh, quite, quite. All right. Enough about the old hair. Do Natasha, what are we doing uh, first here? What's our story? Okay. With X Men Apocalypse fanning the flames of the X Men faithful, the studio has yet to officially announce another X Men movie, though many are rumored including a Deadpool sequel and an X-Force movie. But that all changed with word coming from producer Simon Kinberg that a new mutant spin-off movie is in active development and close to casting. Speaking with IGN, Kinberg said, Josh Boone and his writing partner are working on the script. They're doing a really nice job of it, and it's a really cool one because in many ways, like Deadpool, was so different from the mainline X-Men movies, New Mutants. It's maybe not as different as Deadpool, but it has its own unique original voice to it. New Mutants has more of a young adult vibe to it. Hitfix then added to the conversation saying that they have actually cast Wolf's Bane and Colossus's young sister Magic with Macy Williams from Game of Thrones and Anya Taylor-Joy from The Witch as the respective mutant younglings. Also expected to join the team is Alexandra Ship, who plays Storm in Apocalypse with other mutants, Sunspot and Mirage rumored to be on the team. Dennis, thoughts on a new mutants movie coming soon. Why did Kinberg have to drop the YA in there? Why did he have to add the young adult? I like... Look, there's certain young adult properties, very few of them that I enjoy, which are Harry Potter, uh -huh. Hunger Games. And I just recently listened to the audio version of Star Wars Lost Stars, okay. which was really good. But in general, it has a stigma attached to it that, you know, a lot of like teen soap opery, you know, uh, tr uh, romance triangles, that type of stuff. So I don't know why they had to add that in there. Uh, in terms of the casting, though, I actually really like that. I like Maisie Williams. I love Game of Thrones. Arya Stark is one of my favorite characters, and she's a big reason why. I, I love The Witch. Uh, what's, her, what's her name? Anya Taylor-Joy. Yeah. I thought she was really good in that as well. And then, we, you know, I haven't really seen Storm yet. I mean, I've seen her in the trailer with yeah. Alexander Ship. I'm hoping she's good. So I think that's a good addition. I just don't know why you had to throw that term in there. Jason? I think it's interesting that that's the term that you went against because the X-Men have sort of always been a YA sort of, like, it's always been about these teenagers that can't control their powers. And sometimes I like Jean Grey. Sometimes I don't. Maybe Wolverine's going to steal her away from me. So, like, it's interesting that they're, they're, they're turning right into it. I think it's an interesting way, just like Deadpool, to make the franchise different to make it unique and, it, and it's interesting that new mutants is now a movie because they've talked about this being a tv show yeah. for a long time <clears throat> um my only problem with it i think is it's interesting that i'm excited Maisie williams is going to be in it but wolf's bane is this basically teenage werewolf so why are you going to cover Maisie will williams excuse me with fur josh yeah i mean get just get michael j fox and put her in something else <laughs> um <laughs> The uh, the New Mutants thing, uh, listen, and we talked about this the last time I was on Movie Talk, the Allegiant, the Divergent, the Insurgent, Maze Runner, Scorch Trials, all these <laughs> stupid movies. I, I don't want to call City, them stupid. City of Bones, C yeah. Mortal Instruments, right. Vampire Academy. Yeah. Well, and he, Josh Boone d did Fault in Their Stars, which was pretty good, I guess. I mean, all these kind of like complainy dying uh, teenage movies that are were go are good, but there, there's nothing that excites me when somebody says young adult. <laughs> there really isn't. And I know, and since I was a young adult, I've, I've thought the same thing. Get away from the drama that, that you create with these, these love stories and give me that X-Men action. I, that's why I loved First Class because it was, it was just packed with awesome action, or, origin stories, all that kind of stuff. And I thought you got away from that a little bit in Days of Future Past. I'm hoping that they come back with X-Men Apocalypse. However, 
Netflix would be a perfect place for a new mutant kind of thing. You could extend the storylines. Yeah. You could give me more of them. You wouldn't have this to. This with a serialized aspect would work really well. Yes, absolutely. And because you mentioned a TV show, and we haven't really seen X Men outside of an animated series on TV. That X Men is prime for a TV series. Although this just came to me, this could be the studio punking us mm -hmm. <laughs> because Deadpool first appeared in New Mutants. Cable first yeah. appeared in New Mutants, and the New Mutants became the X Force. So maybe this movie is the secret introduction of Cable so that it'll set up the Deadpool sequel, Deadpool and Cable. I, I, think I don't know. I think it's going to be separate. You because, think so? Because I, I didn't really read the original New Mutants, but I started mm -hmm. reading it when Rob Liefeld did his run, which. Which, which is Cable Deadpool. Yeah, Cable, yeah. Yeah. Domino. Uh, what, what's that guy? Shatter shot or scatter shot or something whatever the like hell. that. Like the guy with the two swords. Buckshot. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I have a feeling they're going to do a separate X Force okay. movie, and then New Mutants is going to be totally different. And, and you know, he's throwing out this young adult thing, and I, I just don't know why he had to throw that term in. Yeah. I mean, he could have st still done the exact same movie, just not throwing that that, that term in there. It's just like X Men, hot teens. Like yeah. that's basically what you get as soon as you hear young. That's adult. sold in that's, a different store. Yeah, that's. It. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? Batman v Superman. Don of Justice has been universally branded as dark, dreary, and no fun, so many wonder what that might mean for Warner Brothers' upcoming Suicide Squad, which looks at the villains inside the universe of a sad Batman and a dour Superman. It appears that the folks over at Birth Movie Death have an answer. According to the site, Warner Brothers is putting tens of millions of dollars into reshoots for Suicide Squad to make the film more lighthearted. A source tells BMD that all of the levity in the Bohemian Rhapsody trailer was every single joke in the film and since fans <laughs> responded well to the trailer Warner Brothers wants more of it for their movie whether or not these reshoots will appease the fans and the studio remains to be seen as Suicide Squad readies its debut on August 5th 2016 Josh do you think Suicide Squad is in trouble after word on these reshoots man we are jumping on a sinking ship now they throw reshoots in I mean if I was love the trailer I'm psyched for the movie did they did they really think that by doing these reshoots that they're going to get fans excited for it? I don't. I don't see why they would. Why they would do that? I'm. I'm. I'm perplexed, Dennis. Uh, I don't. I'm not worried to be honest. Okay. I think if they're going to do these reshoots, as long as they handle them correctly, where they, if if it is for levity and they want to add some jokes to them, as long as they shoot them and then when they bring them back into the editing process, that they don't force them in. If they play them out and go, you know what, that doesn't fit, and keep them. Maybe we'll see it on a Blu-ray deleted scene or something mm -hmm. like that. I'm fine with that. I'm one of those people, you know, I have mixed feelings about Batman v Superman, but the dark nature of it does, isn't what turned me off because yeah. I love The Dark Knight. That, that is a humorless yeah. movie. You know, most, most of Chris Nolan's films are pretty <laughs> yeah, humorless. Yeah, pretty humorless, yeah. Um, so that's not my problem with it. So I don't think this is going to fix it. I also love the trailer. I don't think there's anything to worry, be worried about. Jason? I'm not worried at all. I also want to, like throw this out uh, with the baby in the bathwater reshoots are not a dirty word every movie every major motion picture out there that has over a hundred million dollars does a reshoot every single one the only time to be worried when it's like 20th century fox and fantastic four <laughs> and they're like we gotta get we gotta change this whole ending god yeah. that's the time to be worried right. i actually think this is a positive thing if the source is real that they want to inject more humor i think that's an awesome thing that the power of the internet that the filmmakers are like oh they really like that so let's make more i also don't think that the humor in the trailer is the the humor from the entire film because if you know anything about harley quinn and how uh, maniacal she is there's no way that that's every harley joke in the entire movie i i, I call i call bs on that right away yeah i'd be worried i'd be a little worried if they said that yeah, those if those rumors are true that that's every single yeah. joke i can't as long as they don't add the the let's go save the world exactly. or whatever like that type of humor if they start putting that into the movie, I'm like, no, 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 take that out. I think like the beautiful part about this movie is that we're we're rooting for villains, yeah, and that's the Suicide Squad, and and th there is a really hard thing that not many movies, you know, Iron Man did it, Iron Man two, three, not so much, but there's that perfect balance of action, humor, and depth, and we, like you said, Dark Knight, there was no humor yeah. in that, there was no humor in any of those Batman's really, but the original Batman with Michael Keaton did have some great humor to it. And that's why I think of all those movies, that's the one that stands the test of time. So if, if again, if the reshoots are coming in with comedy and they're not just jammed in your face for comedy's sake, 
then by all means, give me more Holly, Harley Quinn. Yeah, and also, and also David Ayer is a strong director. Yeah. Like that's what I that that's to me is what doesn't worry me about any of this. This this shows to me it's it's like David Ayer looked at his movie and is like I can make it a little bit better by just tweaking a couple things like that. And that's a, and and that's a that's a good move. Also, yeah. I think Suicide Squad is going to be the movie that at the end of this year we're all like, man. So I think you remember how like I don't know for me Kingsman last year was the big surprise. Mm -hmm. I yeah. didn't expect Kingsman to to like be as enjoyable. For me, I think Suicide Squad is going to be the movie for this year. I, I think this is supposed to be, it's going to be like the next Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, I where, agree. Where it's going to be kind of fun and something different that we Just hadn't really seen before. Different. And, and, you know, we all know Suicide Squad's coming out, but I think the general public, That's they, what was... they, they're not familiar with, they see Joker in there and we haven't seen, like, they'll put a major marketing push uh, when it gets closer to the movie where they'll start showing a lot more Joker, a lot more Batman, yeah. and a lot more Harley <laughs> Quinn because those are the characters that everyone knows. Mm -hmm. And we're not, I think we're, like you said, the general public doesn't know. So people like, this looks cool. Margot Robbie's in it. You know what I mean? And then the word of mouth from those people who aren't necessarily comic book fans who don't know anything are going to go see that movie. That, the word of mouth of this one, I think, is going to be pretty awesome. Yeah. All right, what's next? In a casting report released yesterday and reported on by Movie Beat, Marvel is gearing up an official reboot to the vampire action franchise, Blade. While there is no word on a director, the studio is reportedly looking at a very short list of actors that includes Michael B. Jordan and Birth of a Nation's Nate Parker, with relative unknowns also on the list, such as Emile Amin, who had a small role in Lee Daniels' The Butler, and Elijah Kelly from Red Tails and Hairspray. Marvel aims to start filming the movie this summer and as of this report, no mention on whether or not Blade will get an R rating. With Marvel owned by, of course, Disney, fans are expecting a friendlier PG-13. Jason, what do you think of Michael B. Jordan-led Blade reboot? I am excited about this because Blade, if you remember, was technically the first superhero movie to start off the superhero franchise. I believe the first one was in 98, like mm -hmm. the year before the X-Men movies. I think this is a smart move. They have the rights. Let's do it. I don't know about Michael B. Jordan. Mm. I'm actually... Um, I would go with uh, uh, Elijah Kelly yeah. from Red Tails. You ever seen Red Tails? Red Tails, uh, there's some strong acting in that movie. That movie really surprised me. Elijah Kelly, I think, would do a better job as Blade than Michael B. Jordan. Michael B. Jordan, I think, would take Blade too jokey. Mm -hmm. And we want, you want, that's the idea of Blade, man, is that yeah. he's very serious while killing vampires. I would, I, I, my biggest hope is that they bring back Wesley Snipes as a mentor. Yeah. Oh, like Whistler? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And, you know, because, Let's be honest. There's nothing bad about Snipes in anything. That guy is just, <laughs> he's, he's an American treasure. Um, so if they brought back Snipes and then I, I love, I think we're a little um, Michael B. Jordan saturated right now. Yes, I, I agree. think I think Michael B. Jordan needs, because Creed was amazing, don't get me wrong, but let's like get him away from the superhero franchise, do a couple of other movies and then get something that really fits, fits him. Give me a no name for Blade because Blade was basically a no name that Wesley Snipes kind of took. For, totally. Because for, I wasn't a, a Blade fan. I didn't know much about the comics at all, but I I love that franchise. I love that movie. Even the Ryan Reynolds ones with everybody hated. I, I enjoyed those movies. And I remember watching Blade over and over and over again. And really and truly, when you think about it, Blade kind of started a vampire revolution. Because then after that, we started getting vampires in everything. You know what mm. I mean? Blade was that first movie that was like, oh, Blade we can... responsible for Twilight. I like it. Yeah. I'll go with it. Go with me on that one just for a second. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, give me the Blade reboot. I'm in. I have mixed feelings about it. Because, you know, there was a lot of rumors of it being maybe going to like a Netflix series instead and being a little mm. darker, maybe fit into that Daredevil, Punisher, Luke Cage, Jessica Jones universe. Mm. Um, and, and with this, yeah, I don't think Disney is going to do a, a rated R. I mean, we're all talking about how with Deadpool, the success of Deadpool, that opens up a lot of possibilities. But Marvel is one that they don't need to take that risk, right? Yeah, Marvel I mean, Studios probably wouldn't do an R-rated movie, to be honest with you. Yeah, they probably be, won't. because Fox, they kind of had to. I mean, they have X-Men, which was successful, mm -hmm. but then, you know, Fantastic Four didn't do so well. They took a chance on Deadpool. It paid off big for them. So for them, it's like, okay, maybe we'll do some more rated R movies. Marvel's doing great with their PG-13 films. That. They're fine. So I just don't see them doing a rated R Blade. I, th I think we'll get, you know... A PG-13 Blade would be kind of a waste. I don't me. know. D Dennis kind of sold me as um, Blade as like a Netflix series would be pretty awesome. Yeah. 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 So and in terms of Michael B. Jordan, I, 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 he's one of the best young actors today. Sure. So if they cast him, I'm fine with that. Uh, I'm not familiar with that Elijah Kelly uh, actor. Go so. see Red Tails. Anybody that's not seen Red Tails, go out and see Red Tails. So Just I, I had to look him up. But Nate Parker as well, yeah. I, th I think I'd be good with. 
All right, guys, now on to our buy or sell segment. Uh, Natasha, what do we got first? One of the biggest teases in Batman v Superman came in the form of a Batman dream sequence that showed a symbol of Darkseid as a proof that the big baddie will be in the primary villain of Justice League Part 1. Many fans also look to the cameo of Flash as a sign of things to come in the superhero team-up that begins filming in 11 short days. It was this topic of conversation on the Empire podcast where Zack Snyder appeared recently when asked of the dream sequence Snyder said let's just say this I think it's okay to look at the extended dream sequence as an impressionistic view of a possible future and that's not hard to I mean that's in the sequence I'm not spoiling anything or making up anything that you should see so the connection with the flash part of that sequence you can speculate whether he's coming from that reality or another one that's the fun stuff to try and figure out exactly what flash is saying to Bruce and what it means we know so we're not making it up when Snyder was asked point blank if he can say anything about dark side he played coy saying i mean maybe he exists out in the universe somewhere he's looking for something something that's against life i guess we will have to wait and see when justice league part ones comes to theater november 17th 2017 dennis by our cell zach snyder's comments to empire podcast uh, I'm going to sell his comments because I don't know why he's being so coy about Darkseid. We all know he's coming. We saw that nightmare sequence in mm -hmm. Batman v Superman. We saw that flash kind of, you know, from the future scene. Do you know how upset fans would be if Darkseid wasn't in Justice League after showing those two scenes? They'd be pretty pissed off. And uh, I'm kind of concerned, not concerned, but I'm worried what the look of Darkseid is going to be. Look, I know Darkseid came first. Thanos was a kind of a ripoff of, Th of Thanos is a ripoff. He's of Dark a ripoff yeah. of Dark Side. <laughs> but you have to remember the perception of the casual movie yes. going audience. They don't know that. So most of the people going to see that are, are comic book movie fans, but aren't comic book fans, are going to think if he looks the way he looks in the comic books, they're going to be like, "Why did?" DC rip, rip off, off Thanos, Marvel. Yep. So I, I'm very interested in that. Jason? Um, well, there was that deleted scene that they released. And in the deleted scene, you see this blackish figure with horns that looks very similar to the the um, Dark Side's lead general, Steppenwolf. And he's holding three mother boxes. Because in Cyborg, we saw a mother box. And a mother box is the DC device that you use to travel to Apocalypse, Dark Side's home planet. I agree with you. Like, I don't know why they're being coy with this either. And my only guess would be that maybe Darkseid's not the villain of part one. Okay. Maybe he's the villain of part two. And maybe we're introducing somebody else in part one that will lead us to Darkseid. Because there were like, is it somebody that he would be like playing a marionette? Yes, in part yeah, one? yeah. Like maybe he sends somebody else to Earth first to weaken Earth before he's going to show up. And I agree with you, the look, that's an interesting challenge. But I, I have a feeling that you could do some really, really cool looks with Darkseid because he's been interpreted in some different ways in the comic books. Like sometimes he's seen as like all black. Sometimes he's seen as just like a big hulky man in a business suit with gl glowing red eyes. Uh, um, so I'm not worried about that, but I, it is interesting, the coyness. I, I think we may see another villain is why, is why they're doing that. Well, I don't think they're going to go with that business suit because no, no. that <laughs> looks pretty bad. Uh, Josh? Uh, on Billions next episode, I believe Darkseid okay. shows up in a Ooh, business suit. Yeah, yeah. Um, they... I, I don't know a ton about, I mean, obviously Darkseid is, is the one villain in, in a lot of these DC comics, and especially in, in <laughs> Justice League, that ruins everything. I mean, he's a, he's a super, they, they kind of blew it, I thought, in Batman v Superman with Doomsday because he just got shoved in at the end of the movie, mm -hmm. right? And, and he it exploded Metropolis and Gotham and whatever else was in his way. It would be nice for them to bring it back just a tad and not give us this giant, villain that we all kind of want in order to tease for two which I, which I like that idea it would be kind of cool though if they re-envisioned dark side mm -hmm. gave him something that the fans weren't expecting in order to maybe create a little controversy but not go completely away from what we know as dark side so i think i'm gonna buy it i'm gonna buy this i like where Zack snyder's going yeah i i think you might be right where they might tease dark side in the first part mm -hmm. and then really the big battle with him will be in the second part but they might have something uh, where they have him send down someone. I mean, again, much like in it, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. Could, it could be anything. Like, I mean, there were rumors for a long time that Justice League Part 1 was going to be Brainiac sent by Darkseid mm. and that the Justice League was going to beat Brainiac and then Green Lantern was going to show up out of nowhere and be like, and they were going to be like, we beat Brainiac, join our team. And Green Lantern is going to be like, there's this guy called Darkseid out there. He's, that's nothing. This guy's yeah. big. All right. So who knows? All right, what's next? 
Continuing its trend of taking animated classics and making them into movies, Disney is now looking at its first fully animated feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, as the template. Variety is reporting the development of Rose Red, Snow White's sister, into a live-action movie. Snow White and the Hutzman writer Evan Doherty will come in for a polish on the original draft written by Justin Mers. Rose Red tells the story of when Snow White is cursed into unconsciousness after biting into a poison apple. Her strange sister Rose Red is forced to undertake a quest with the dwarves to find a way to break the curse and bring Snow White back to life. No casting announcements have been made. Josh, buy or sell a movie about Snow White's sister. <laughs> <laughs> really? You're going to start with me on this one? <laughs> I mean, nothing says get me excited like something with more Snow White and the Huntsman. Kind of, that movie was brutal. Uh, I'm selling this one. I'm Rose Red, I, you know, if you throw Melisandre from Game of Thrones in there and maybe make it R-rated <laughs> and you're giving me some hot redhead i no i'm i sorry i'm i'm going down a wormhole here guys no i'm selling this i don't really care i'm off i'm off it yeah i'm selling it as well i didn't know snow white had a sister <laughs> yes uh, and i thought this, had she had you known though dennis oh yeah i thought the story was made up um i yeah i i have to sell it and i i just evan doherty he wrote uh, snow white and the huntsman he's wrote uh he's writing the new one he wrote right? the sequel okay and yeah. then he also wrote tmnt which i didn't hate one or two just the one? first one first okay one. i didn't hate it but yeah. the writing wasn't the thing that i liked no. about it yeah. right? no, no. and then i think uh he's writing oh he wrote divergent oh nice um and <laughs> track record yeah psyched. And he's, psyched. Writing, he's writing the new tomb raider movie so that's okay. another thing to look out right. for so that's not going to get me excited, J uh, Jason. Uh, I'm going to sell this as well, but I would buy it <laughs> if it said that Rose Red was going to set up the Grumpy movie. Okay. Oh. Uh, yeah. See, everybody's in now. See? It's a shared universe. Yes, yes. the shared, shared universe. Snow White cinematic universe. It's be Snow White, <laughs> Rose Red, the dwarves. Like, there's just going to be. And wait till the avant garde film, The Apple. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> and what does every character in the Snow White universe have like a, an inanimate and then an adjective? So it's like licorice black, rose red. Like, I don't understand. This, this whole thing just boggles the mind. Watery sky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, now we're on to the portion of our show where we talk about box office predictions brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Every Friday, we try and predict our top movies of the weekend. And uh, Josh, why don't we start with you? What are your top five box office uh, numbered? Okay, so we're going to go. Obviously, Batman vs. Superman stays at one. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I mean, that's, a, I think that's going to stay at number one until we get to Jungle Book, probably, right? Uh, then. Zootopia stays at two. My Big Fat Greek Wedding at three. Uh, do I... Everybody wants some? Does that make it into the top five? <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> um, okay, God is Not Dead, two, because it's getting so many theaters, goes at four. Everybody wants some at five. Okay, I'll go with uh, similar to yours. Batman v Super at number one. Zootopia at number two. Um, Big Fat Greek Wedding, two at three. God's Not Dead at four. And five, though, I'll put uh, Miracles from Heaven. Miracles I think that will heaven. still have a little staying power. Jason? Mine is exactly like yours, except for my number five, I would throw in Hardcore Henry because I have hope that it'll 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 barely leak into the top five. Um, but I'm more curious about what do we think is the amount, what is the amount Batman v Superman will make this weekend? That, actually, that's the more interesting question versus even opening weekend, mm -hmm. right? Because opening weekend, everyone predicted anywhere between, let's say, 160 to, let's say, 200. And right. it made 160. 166 is what Box Office Mojo says right now. Okay. So it, it, it did pretty well. It didn't do as high as maybe some people thought, and it didn't do as bad as you know other people were predicting. But the second weekend is the big mystery. Mm -hmm. That's where we're like, okay, now is this movie going to have staying power? Is it going to have repeat viewings? We all know like some some of the fans loved it, so they'll yeah. be seeing it again. Are the casual fans going to come back and watch it? What's your number? I see. Here's the interesting thing: Batman v Superman. This entire week. Nobody has not stopped talking about it. Yes. There's been a new article, a new tweet, a new thing. So I actually think that, that some of the people that might have hated it uh, uh, um, are going to, I think, maybe give it a second viewing to be like, well, maybe I'm missing something here. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, was, I was steady in the middle on it. I, I would give it a B. I, I didn't think it was amazing, didn't think it was terrible. I'm actually going to see it again this weekend because I want to see it in IMAX. My number is 
75. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to make 75 million this weekend. Josh. Yeah, I I don't think that that repeat business is going to be big. I'm I'm going to go at 55 million. Um, it could like creep towards 60, but I think 55 million is the number. Okay, I'm going to go a little under yours. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be like 72, 73 million, which I think all of us have it's going to drop off more than 50%. That's yeah. what all three of us yeah. are saying, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Which, you know, we'll we'll see how long, but I the thing for me is worldwide it's doing it's great. It's killing worldwide, yeah. yeah. But we're just talking domestic. Yes. Yeah, and I wouldn't I'm not going to go see it again in theater. I'm not going to spend the money, but I'm looking forward to seeing it on DVD, I guess. Okay. You know? All right, guys, now before we get into mailbag, uh, we it's April Fools today, as you guys know. We uh, Mark Ellis interviewed the natural born pranksters, uh, Roman uh, Atwood, Dennis Rohde, and Vitali about this new movie, Natural Born Pranksters, that's debuting today in theaters and on VOD Digital. You can check that out. Here, we're, here's a small clip of that. What is it? Have you guys got into the psychology at all about like what makes you? Like want to prank people? Like why is it so fun? Because it like like for me, I was actually I did a season of Punk, and I found it to be very very harrowing because you're just sitting there all day and you're just preparing mm-hmm. to fool somebody mm-hmm. that's going to last all of 15 seconds. Like what is it about the the psychological makeup that is so exciting to you guys? It's an adrenaline for sure, adrenaline because you don't know what's going to happen. You go out there and you're like, am I going to get punched in the face? Am I going to die? Am I going to go to jail? What's going to happen? So it's an adrenaline. Yeah, it's, I got him. You got him. Got him. It's our, like, wh- why do you climb a mountain? Because it's got there. Yeah. That kind of thing. I think yeah. our niche, uh, at least for Dennis and I off the bat, was we were, I mean, when we started YouTube pranks, there was a, a handful of pranksters on YouTube. They were very family friendly. They were very, um, they were very polite, yeah. you know, funny some videos type stuff. We came out, uh, Vitaly also came out around the same time. We were the only ones doing edgy stuff. We found a niche, which was pranking police. Like yeah. we never did anything <laughs> illegal, but we yeah. pranked police and nobody could understand the fear of that. Like, how could you do that? To a co- well, we're not doing anything illegal. Yeah, we're not even yeah. approaching them. They're just over there and we just turn our back and like we're in our own space. We're basically fishing they, for them. We're fishing for police. And That's now you guys have found so much success doing this stuff. So how do you keep your edge? Like, like <laughs> now you guys have all these tools. Like you said, you're making a movie. You can do whatever you want. How do you keep that like independent edge that you need when you are fooling somebody? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, that's <laughs> when you really go into accomplices. That's a really big help because now if we run a prank, you get recognized. But then I can bring in accomplices and okay, you're the police officer, you're the ambulance, mm-hmm. you're going to be the one that does this. And then you send them in and you just sit there and watch. You set up friends now. Yeah. You set up their friends. And I so. noticed that watching the film too, you guys have gone from just, I mean, you guys still prank plenty of people, yeah. but it's also you get to be the puppet master behind yeah. the scenes. Yeah, we so have much to be now. It's like, it's like a, a, in the prank world, and this happened to the best pranksters in the entire world, it's, it's a blessing to blow up, but it's also a curse because you basically you be recognized everywhere. Yeah. So it's it's become a, like if us three go out together, I don't think you can really film a prank anymore without some disguise Disguises, or because yeah. somebody knows one of us, yeah. you know? So it's like, and nobody well, ever goes yeah. along like, they always tell their buddy, oh, you're that guy. I'm like, dang, yeah, <laughs> right I'm the about to prank you. And then your buddy's like, yeah. wait a minute. And there's the Natural Born Pranksters interview. You can watch the full interview on our YouTube channel where Mark talks to them further about their movie. Remember, you can check that out in theaters and on VOD today. Now we're on to Mailbag. Uh, Natasha, what do we got? Okay, Cody Enos writes, Dear Collider, with a new superhero movie coming out faster than a snail eating a pancake and big franchise franchises blooming more properties than a flower bed in the middle of a field i was wondering how come these films that spend hundreds of millions of dollars almost always have just okay cgi films such as ex machina the witch and other moderately low budget films seem to have a better handle on how to hide enhance and utilize cgi but whenever someone sees a tentpole film almost always people will come out saying wish the cgi was better so i was wondering why is that I think it's apples and oranges. I don't think you can compare that that stuff because the CGI in kind of lower budget movies, they, they're more subtle and they're not going for, with these big tentpole movies, you're creating something huge, right? Like a Hulk or Ultron and a bunch of bots or- you know, Starkiller base. Yeah, yeah, like you're creating these things out of nothing where a lot of these low budget things, they're, they, they're just kind of, 
either hiding things or masking things or doing very subtle effects and they're not doing a lot of them so they're able to kind of craft that and they kind of the stories don't demand that so I, that's that's my reason jason uh you know i want to say first off cody thank you for pointing that out because i've been thinking that for like about a year now uh, i've been noticing it too i also think you're, you're you're on the money too and i also think it's a little <laughs> bit too that the smaller films their cgi is all done by one effects house whereas bigger movies they shop it out to like 12 different mm -hmm. effects house that's the reason why the credits run for 15 minutes uh, um, but it is something that i have been noticing and I, and I agree with you that i think the smaller films they focus on their like we're only going to make like the android and ex machina that's our only special effect whereas like someone like star wars they have like we've got to figure out how, how does jakku look yeah. how, how does the Millennium falcon look how does the the job of the hut look you know um because there is a shot in force awakens that has bothered me <laughs> ever since I saw it, it's and, and it's just a little bit of the Is it um, when the sword goes through Han. No, no, <laughs> it's 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 where the uh, the Millennium Falcon when they're on Jakku and 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 its butt whips past the camera when mm -hmm. it does that hard U turn. Yeah, yeah. Like the Millennium Falcon has always looked a little rubbery when it does that turn to me. Okay, what about you? Well, I'll tell you what, Cody, your comparisons about snails eating pancakes get me about happy. My mom is sweet tea on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Jesus, how many puns do you have to throw in that thing, dude? <laughs> Uh, good, good question though. I, Josh McCuga lives in Hollywood, California. <laughs> if you'd like to go track him down, um, you know, I I notice. I think I'm one of those guys that I get really annoyed by the like the just fight after fight after fight where they like break and break and break and the people just like pop back up because CGI helps you and and you throw through all that kind of stuff. I would love to see more practical fight effects like in movies like The Raid and stuff. But John I'm, Wick. Yeah, yeah, John mm -hmm. Wick, things like that. Um, but I think the CGI that they really do well are when they do the places and they mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. for, like Guardians in the Galaxy CGI was what sold me on that entire movie. I loved everything in there. Now on other ones, where the CGI is in the best, it usually comes around in the action scenes because mm -hmm. there's so much mixing involved in it, and you can't do everything perfect. I mean, they could sit in the edit bay for five years and still not get it perfect. Yeah, true, true, true. Yeah, true. and I also think that, you know, with big budgets things, I, like, you know, uh, a lot of the stuff that you see and you notice, like the CG, you know, you're talking about the Millennium Falcon, Force Awakens, but there's a ton of... Uh, visual effects work going on that people don't oh, we, notice. Oh, totally. Like if you watch, I mean, uh, we ha we got the Force Awakens Blu-ray early we, for a commentary video, and I watched the behind-the-scenes stuff, and you'll see just there's so much. I mean, for all the talk about like practical, yeah. practical, practical on things like Mad Max or even Force Awakens, there's so much green well, screen all, and visual yeah, effects. All you on. have to do is watch the the Mad Max Fury Road. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blu-ray. When you see that, like, they literally CGI'd in all the hills around them because they were in flat desert the entire movie. Yeah. yeah. You know, for safety reasons, and you're just like, wow. Like, I never would have considered that that hill was CGI. They do that all the time. And that's where the CGI like <laughs> is strengthened. What I think it is is that bigger movies tend to do these moves, these flourishes, like of, of the big power move or the character walking to the camera that we tend to notice and we tend to be more critical of. Mm -hmm. And that's where we notice the weaknesses of CGI. Yeah. What's some horrible CGI you've seen recently? The most horrible? Oof. I mean, I don't know about like super recently, but I remember when X-Men Origins came out. Mm -hmm. I was watching, I was like, there's His claws? No yeah, his claws oh. and even some of the bullet shots. And mm -hmm. I was looking, I was like, I could do that at home on After Effects. <laughs> I'm like, why is this on a big budget movie? Like I was, I was, I was, my mind was blown. The, the one that, well, it's, it's an old movie, but I recently rewatched the original Lord of the Rings movies on Blu-ray. And uh, anytime that Legolas does the crazy flips yeah. and he does it in The Hobbit too, where he's like running across these stones with where gravity doesn't exist in this world. Huh. Huh. Yeah, anytime Legolas does these weird flips, uh, looks terrible. Anything for you? Uh, the last Transformers movie I thought was just absolutely brutal <laughs> CGI wise like when every they time they turned into the little box things or whatever when yeah. it like went yeah, it's weird because Transformers uh, even though I don't like the franchise all the movies before the visual effects were fantastic yeah they uh, were the first movie's amazing this yeah. one they just mailed in a dinosaur they're like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. alright what's next Paul M. writes, Hi, Collider team. My question is related to the recent backlash around the amount of spoiler footage shown in trailers. Do you think that a big studio would have the guts to release a major movie without any trailers at all? I'm thinking particular, particularly with BVS. Would seeing no trailer have changed your views on the film? Surely just calling a movie Batman vs. Superman is enough to get people in to see it, and would this increase the box office also? Josh, what do you think? I'm, I, this is one of those things I'm kind of passionate about because I thought a movie like Southpaw was ruined by the trailer. Mm -hmm. 
because that was a really, really well done movie. I really enjoyed that movie. Kind of cookie cutter, but really well done. I think a movie like Batman v Superman, there's so many people talking on so many blogs about things that everything is going to get spoiled regardless. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like minute 37 is when Wonder Woman shows up and da 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 So I think in those kind of movies, the trailers are what gets you super excited. They get you, they, they, they have those oh wow moments. Would it be, it would have, Batman v Superman had more wow moments if they kept Doomsday out of it or even kept Wonder Woman out of it. We talked about it on Schmoes last night, sure. But I think you kind of have to put at least like a little bit of teaser in there. I think there's a really happy ground that we need to reach and we're, we're not there yet. Jason? You know, 10 Cloverfield Lane released one trailer before that movie. And that one trailer for a movie that I don't think most people knew even existed, that got me so excited for the movie to see it just off that one trailer. I think it is possible. I think if you craft a great trailer, one great trailer, I think there's enough there. But I can understand why studios aren't like that because studios are like, we can't bet it all on one thing. Right. We can't, we gotta make sure. Like we spent so much money on this. I do agree with you that uh, Batman v Superman could have shown us less. Mm -hmm. I think Star Wars could have shown us less. Um, I, I'm a little worried, right? I hope there's more to Civil War because I'm worried. I, I'm kind of worried that I've seen like the end battle of Civil War now, and I'm, you know, and um, I, I wish they hadn't put Spider Man in the trailer. Um, but it is a happy medium. There are certain movies I think Star Wars could have done it. I think Force Awakens could have just gone off the original teaser, and then that's it. I was actually fine with them release. They, remember, they released that teaser. Then they had like a another trailer. Did they show like Star Wars Celebration? That's yeah. What, yeah. And then they showed one more. Mm -hmm. I was fine with that. It was what happened was after they showed that one on Monday Night Football. They showed, then they showed like all these TV spots. And inter, like they they just totally. Um, mm. There's no way. There's no way a, a movie studio would ever not release a trailer. That's a box office suicide. Yeah. yeah. Like the trailers are so important that there's a reason why they have to have them play in front of other movies like they are so adamant even though technically let's say a tv spot reaches x amount of people like mm. millions of people and let's say you throw a trailer in front of people who are watching a movie and it's less but they know those are the dedicated movie fans those are yeah. the people that are willing to come out to see it so they have to show something to those people they also at have least to, yeah they have to do that because of the, also middle america yeah. because we love movies here everybody watching loves movies but not everybody in america is like us right. yeah. and sees every single trailer and every tv spot and reads every article on collider like they don't do that and on the flip side of that too is you could get an amazing trailer mm -hmm. and the movie be really terrible yes true um, which has happened more times than not i i loved your comparison about 10 cloverfield lane because that is one of those trailers that got me excited to see that movie the movie totally paid off for me but there's got, you know, like Deadpool, that whole marketing campaign mm -hmm. without a trailer. And there were just these cool PSAs. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the, the the things that movie studios aren't doing is thinking outside the box marketing wise <laughs> and creating some really cool viral campaigns or campaigns that reach different audiences. I think that, that marketing gets stale in a lot of these studios. And they're just like, listen, we have Batman in the title. Yeah. Let's just throw out well, a picture. Or of they, they lean on the press junket and they're like, yeah. the press junket's going to do it all. And it's like, and yeah, Deadpool did really prove that like you do something unique with your marketing and you will really make people believe that there's something more to this movie that we haven't seen also deadpool had the the advantage of being an r-rated movie yes. so they couldn't put a lot of the jokes in the yeah. trailers yeah <laughs> that and it was a unique circumstance yeah. where that type of humor for that marketing mm -hmm. campaign totally worked you can't do what you did with deadpool with batman v no, no 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 even no. if it was rated r you still couldn't have done that but yet. they but they 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 hit on it a little bit because like the turkish airline ads mm -hmm. were a smart way to do it mm -hmm. um um, they could have done, they've done some stuff where they did LexCorp, uh, uh, the Forbes ad. And then mm -hmm. I saw that they just released like a, an Instagram photo where it was like Lex Luthor's mugshot. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, the statement from LexCorp being like, we disavow our CEO, da, 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 da. So I'm like, oh, is the viral campaign still going on? Mm -hmm. Like that's the type of stuff to me that intrigues people. And that's, they, 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 tip, they dip their toe into it and they, and they, they should have just stepped into it. Making yeah. these movies real life as opposed to Yes, yeah, yeah, a viral, a real life experience, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I agree, they should kind of pull back on them. We don't have to see, because right now it's what, a teaser and like three trailers? Well, no, no, don't forget the, the, the five second teaser to the teaser. Right? Yes, yeah. uh, I think <laughs> so you have. one teaser and one trailer might be good enough. I do, because usually I find that they, the, the third trailer, the trailer that comes out usually like a couple weeks before the movie, usually always gives away the third act. Mm -hmm. Like nine times out of 10, always gives away the third oh, act. Oh, speaking of that, that Civil War trailer, that better not be the final. If if that I'm hoping that's not if the, the final, final battle. scene is in that parking lot, I will be 
pissed off. <laughs> I mean, it's the, it's a scene from Marvel vs. Capcom, the video game. They're yep. all just yeah, like yeah, flying yeah, yeah. at each Look, other. Look, I'm totally fine with that scene being in the movie, but if that is the final act and the final part where they actually mm -hmm. throw down, I'm going to be upset. Yeah. Let's put a little small bet. Five bucks, it's the final scene. Okay. I say five, uh, five bucks. Wait, wait, it is final not. scene or final battle? Final, final battle. battle. Final battle. Final battle. Okay. Final I say battle. it is not. Okay. You say it is. I say it is. I, I, I'm with Josh. I think it is. Oh my god! I'm gonna be so mad. I'm gonna be so mad. <laughs> I believe the peanut gallery agreed with me. Thanks. <laughs> All right, guys. Now on to live Twitter questions. You can tweet us at Collider Video. And Natasha is gonna pick out a few. What do we got? Griffin Demir writes, "What Batman villain would you like to see in the next Batman movie that hasn't been on the big screen before?" Hmm. That hasn't been. Hasn't on the big, been. That's on. A tough. Because my first gut reaction was Two Face, but then we've seen him yeah. before. We've seen him before. Um, we've seen Riddler before. Yeah. We've seen Scarecrow. You know what would be an interesting one? It would, and it would kind of lean into uh, a very superhero Batman movie, uh, Clayface. Yeah. Because mm. he has some really great episodes on the Batman animated series where he's this shapeshifter, but he's big. But it's the idea of doing, it would make it a Batman versus a monster mm -hmm. movie, which is something we haven't seen before. I'm, I'm going to go, I know he's asking for villain, but um, there's a lot of Batman comics that don't have Bruce Wayne, like Azrael. I wouldn't mm -hmm. mind seeing like an Azrael storyline in some sort of movie because those were some of the comics that I read and really enjoyed. Would you guys like to see the Red Hood story come? Yes, come to, okay. I yeah, really absolutely. would. Yeah, so I that's possible. One yeah, that's yeah. possible. Yeah. All right, what's next? Ariana Alba asks, "Would you like to see Poison Ivy in the DCEU? Maybe even in Suicide Squad 2? Are oh. we talking about the Poison Ivy soft cores on? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If that's, when she when <laughs> she first read that, I thought it, like a reboot. I was like. Is there like a cult following yeah. for this? Uh, Drew Barrymore. Where's Alyssa be Milano in a, when you like Drew, Was it Drew Barrymore yeah. in the first one? Or Drew something? Barrymore. Uh, I'm yeah. going to get us back on track. The girl uh, who played Icebox <laughs> in Little Giants was also in so, one. So I think Poison Ivy should be Suicide Squad too. That's my thoughts. Yeah. 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 I think, she, I mean, Uma Thurman, obviously, that whole movie was a wash, but uh, the Poison Ivy could be really well done. Yes. If, if done right. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I'd like to see. All right, what's next? T and Pies asks, any initial thoughts to the Sicario 2 news? Full cast is returning. It's to me, I, I love Sicario. It was great. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we need to see a sequel. It, does, it doesn't Just seem like end. a movie that needs is, a sequel. Are you sure this isn't like an April Fool's? This seems like an April Fool's. <laughs> I don't know. Sicario 2, it ended. Like, yeah. what is it? Just post more post credits? I mean, it'd be like The Revenant 2. Yeah. What do you do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the bear comes back. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we had heard something about maybe a like a spin off with Benicio del Toro's character. Okay. That would be Maybe awesome. that I could do that, but with the, the existing cast, <laughs> I mean, where does Emily Blunt? Blunt's character go from there, right? I mean, the whole point was she was, you know? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. All right. Uh, what's next? Devante Levon Davis asks, how do you feel about Sony continuing the Spider-Man 3 with a Venom crossover? The Amazing Spider-Man 3. Sorry. Uh, Is that... I don't think that that's something? happening. I think they're rebooting. Are they April Foolsing us? I heard oh. they were talking. They, they There were some rumors about a Venom. They were going to make a Venom movie. No, they're making a Venom They are making a Venom movie. movie. Oh, okay, okay. But, but they said that it was kind of going to be a standalone and not be part of like, you know how Spider-Man is part of the MC, going to be part of the yeah. MCU. He's in Civil War. Even the, mm -hmm. I think, Spider-Man standalone movie will be part of the MCU. They're talking about maybe a Venom movie that's not part of it and maybe oh, not even okay. having Spider-Man in it. Um I've said it before on the show. I think Venom is one of the greatest villains in any comic books. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they wasted him in that in Spider-Man 3 always upsets me because Spider-Man was one of my favorite franchises and then they just you know, they Yeah, that was not Eddie the Eddie Brock that I knew from no, the comic correct. books. I yeah. that was it almost seemed it was just angrier Peter Parker or something yeah. like mm -hmm. that. And yeah, and he it looked, I don't know. I, I thought the CG on him just did not no. look good at all. Talk about he wasn't CGI. big and hulky and he was just no. I don't know. I didn't yeah. like that at all. It was all. also one of those things that Venom deserves his own movie as the villain, not to be like shoehorned in at the yeah. end. Yeah. But, yeah. but in the comics, though, they've turned him in more into like an anti hero instead of mm -hmm. like a straight yeah. up villain. And now Carnage is more of the villainous mm -hmm. guy. Yeah. yeah. All right. What's next? Jonathan Peck asks, What two actors would you love to see team up in a movie? I think Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Cruise. Uh, Leo and Tom Cruise. Talk about heartthrobs, guys. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't wow. mind seeing uh, two of my favorite actors, Edward Norton and Sam Rockwell, do a movie together. Interesting. Yeah. I would love to see... Uh, 
I, this is sort of like city slickers, but different. Like, I would love to see some older actors team up in a Western, like Michael Keaton mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, Sam Elliott. Uh, join, like, a bunch of kind of older, grizzled actors getting together. Maybe it doesn't have to be a Western or something. Not like Old Dogs or freaking that astronaut movie with Clint Eastwood. I want to see something oh, that has La some... Las Vegas? Yeah, Las <laughs> Vegas. Give me something with some grit and some, you know, like these cops that come back one more time to solve a crime that, that wasn't solved before. Sicario 3, old dudes. I don't... It, I would like to see something like that. I would uh, love to see uh, Tom Hanks as his final movie in his career reunite with one of his very first stars, and that's Hooch. <laughs> but it's Hooch is a puppy, and so it's Turner and Hoochie, and it's and he's yeah, it's the puppy of Hooch. You're, you're buying your ticket. <laughs> All right, what's next? Okay, Calvin Johnson asks, who is an actor or, an, or actress that you would like to see play a bad guy slash villain? For me, it's Emily Blunt. Mm. That's pretty good. I think I'd rather see Emily Blunt play a hero. Uh, Captain Marvel? Well, not Captain Marvel, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Edge of Tomorrow? Um, um, wow, a, a villain. That, you know who I, uh, you know I, I've said for a while that I think would make an interesting, um, I don't know where you would put him in the Marvel Universe. I, I do think that Tom Cruise would bring this weird mm -hmm. vibe to the Marvel Universe, especially if he was like a, a, a villain. And I, and, I, and, I, and I can't believe they haven't reached out. Maybe he's too expensive. I don't know. Uh, but I think Tom Cruise as a villain in one of these superhero movies would just be really weird and would give the movie such an interesting look and feel. I wouldn't mind it. I think the reason why is because he likes producing his own movies. Yeah. And so he's really hands-on. So I don't think he would fit into that. You know, if you join he Marvel. He give up the control, yeah. Yeah, in Marvel, like, you do what they mm -hmm. they say. I mean, within the, the guidelines and parameters, but they have a whole system there, and I just don't think he'd fit. But as a villain, I think that would be pretty cool. I mean, we mentioned, has Tom Hanks played, a, a, like, a villain, like a really no, evil guy? No. Uh, I mean, lady killers, maybe, yeah. but, yeah. you know. But I'm talking, like, really <laughs> no, evil. No. You know, like, Hugh Jackman, I know he was uh, Blackbeard in, in Pan or whatever, but mm. I want to see, like, really bad bad guy i th the, there are a few actors i think that besides training day i'd love to see denzel mm -hmm. in something where he's just a straight up bad bad person and a villain george clooney always is like super happy and he's yeah. like you know he's mr oh come on ladies i want to see him do something really bad uh and i would i would love to see um you know, somebody that's always in a car, like, give me, I know that Jim Carrey did the Riddler, but give me, like, dark Jim Carrey from uh, Sunspot, uh, Eternal Sunside of Spotless Mind, but as of, like, a and dark number 23. Villain. Yeah, oh, yeah, number 23. You know, the other person that would be really good would be Helen Mirren. Helen Mirren as, like, a dark villain would be really interesting. Yeah. Uh, Natasha, is there any actor or actress you'd like to see play a villain that normally doesn't? Mm, I can't think of any at the moment, but wasn't Helen Mirren and didn't she have like a Super Bowl ad where she was like kind of salty, like oh, saying she? like, don't drink and drive. And I was like, ooh, like yeah. it left a little pang in my chest. I go. would totally love to see that. Helen Mirren train. <laughs> All right, let's do two more. Okay. Abigail asked, trailer wise, do you like Bohemian Rhapsody for Suicide Squad or Stuck on a Feeling for Guardians of the Galaxy? Oh, both are great. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's. But you got to pick one. Man, I'm gonna go. I love Guardians of the Galaxy, but I'm gonna go Bohemian Rhapsody with Suicide Squad because that song is is so. It's usually done in a, a, like a lighter tone, mm -hmm. i.e., Wayne's World or whatever. But it's a very very sad song. If you listen to the first part of it, I thought that was just awesome scoring. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's close for me, but I'm gonna go have to go with Guardians just because that that trailer with that song stuck in so many people's heads and like got people to actually come mm -hmm. out to the theater to watch it. So I'm going to go with that one. Uh, I have to go with guardians as well. I think it's the better choice uh, because I'm shocked that they haven't done a suicide squad ad with the immigrant song, mm -hmm. which I think is a better fit. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Last one. Okay. Bazinga guy asks <laughs> <laughs> since it's April fools, uh, what are some of your favorite April fools pranks you've ever pulled off? I, mean. uh, I usually don't pull off April Fool's pranks. Uh, the best one that I saw that someone else did was... was today? No, no. <laughs> um, when uh, some people in New York put a bunch of uh, signs for uh, In-N-Out Burger coming soon oh, on a man. bunch of construction oh, sites. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, I thought that was hilarious. Because every time I talk uh. to someone from the East Coast that comes here, they always talk about In-N-Out Burger, and they always have to go there before they leave or... And all that stuff. So I thought that was pretty cruel, but also pretty funny. Yeah. 
You 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 had to tell See, about your, my, your family. I mean, <laughs> my, my in my house, April Fool's Day is a national holiday. I've been working on one for my dad for a couple of weeks now. Uh, I mean, I've called with accents. I've blocked my number. I told him I got arrested when I lived in Italy. Uh, my mom <laughs> pulled pranks. I mean, my dad pulled pranks. My, my grandmother on my dad's side pulled pranks on everybody. She filled my uh, my dad's books in high school she cut out the pages and filled them with pancake butter and baked oh them and then shoved God. them in his backpack um my brother and i wrote a two-page letter with pictures <laughs> of a girl that we told him that my brother got pregnant oh. and my parents drove to state college without calling us to confront us <laughs> and the girl they didn't even think uh, it was, was mean, the girl real oh yeah the girl was real yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, i mean i've pulled them all i've pulled marriage ones i've uh i stole my buddy's car one year and parked it two miles away and like I'd, like uh, put broken glass everywhere and he freaked out and call the cops and everything. I let that one go for a while. I love April Fools, guys. Big uh, fan. Jason, um, I, I I don't. I'm not a big April Fools guy either. Like the best thing that I've done, I, I didn't I didn't drive my buddy's car, <laughs> but like we we uh, completely like taped it shut with clear packing tape. Mm. So like he had to literally slice his door open. Uh, but a, a friend of mine in college, the kind of cruel. But he put an obituary for himself in the paper. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Yeah. That's a clapper. Yeah, right there. and everybody, er oh, man, the phone calls and everything was yeah. nuts. And then um, it, it almost started the proceedings that he almost got kicked out of college because. Uh, the, like a, somebody in the administration saw it. I was like, oh, well, I better like clear out his record. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Natasha, man. anything? Okay. This is going to make me sound like such a loser, but <laughs> me and my brothers, like we were such good little kids that we tried to pull this prank on my parents. We were like going to TP like their room. Right. So we like got all this toilet paper and last minute we chickened out. So all we did was like write April fools in toilet paper, like outside of their door. And they were like, <laughs> Good job, guys. Like, that and was And then great. we just all read a book together. Yeah, yeah, basically. Basically. We all had hot chocolate we're together. <laughs> and, and we love each other. And we went on a family not vacation. Like you, Makuga. Like, yeah, we, we had have... the fireplace on and then <laughs> hot chocolate together. Yeah. Yeah. Stop being jealous of my precious childhood. Okay, oh, guys? I think I forgot the best one. I, I had a fake lawyer go to my dad's dealership and serve him with papers that there was an anti defamation suit against people in Pittsburgh that called him a racist. <laughs> oh, oh, my yes. Forgot about that oh one God. that was amazing well, yeah. cook is the king uh, over uh, here dude. you're, you're wow. going to some Man. dangerous territory yeah. wow. there <laughs> all right <laughs> yep. all right guys that's it for this episode i want to thank the people joining us at this table josh where can people find you you guys can find me here every monday on collider with collider tv talk send us in some questions hashtag a collider tv talk uh we're having a lot a lot of fun this week we're going to do a pilot review of the path the new um God, I forget his last name. Aaron Paul. Aaron Sorry. Paul. Aaron Paul from Breaking Bad. Nice. Uh, you guys can follow me on Twitter and Instagram and my YouTube channel, The Josh McCuga Show. Jason? Uh, you can find me every Wednesday here at the Collider Arrow Recap Show where we make lots of bee puns with Josh <laughs> McCuga. Uh, you can find me on uh, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram at Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N. And then every Monday I do a podcast on iTunes called Geek History Lesson where I teach you nerdy things. And okay. Natasha, where can people find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. And don't forget, guys, we have uh, the Schmodown, Mance versus Roka. It's going to be, gonna be coming one. out today. If you guys saw the promo, yep. the fight, actually, the, the battle lives up to the hype. Man. Also, yeah, TV talk on Monday. And then also, don't forget, uh, this Tuesday, the Star Wars Force Awakens commentary. Uh, Campia, Schnepp, David Griffin, and Christian Harloff did that together. We're going to release that nice. on Tuesday, you can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Collider Videos. And check out Mailbag this weekend. If not, we'll see you guys on Monday. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.